All right. Um, so uh, make sure that uh, you go ahead and introduce yourself in the Zoom chat. Don't forget to do that. Don't forget to right click on your name or your image and then hit rename and just most of you need to just add your state, if you would. That is very helpful. And I don't see anyone joining us by phone. So that is, uh, we usually have to have them introduce themselves. So for some more uh, announcements though, let's talk about how we do these echoes. And uh, so for a more collegial environment, we just use first names. And uh, during the echoes, we always ask you to be conscious of confidential or protected health information. We usually don't run into that in this type of echo, just talking about telemedicine. But if you ever did bring a case study or, um, and, and it had to do with the patient uh, maybe joining uh, a telemedicine uh, oh, platform, that type of thing, we just wouldn't use any names, that type of thing. So please just remember that. One thing that we have that's kind of fun with this echo is that we have an Ask Joe Kingsbury. So if you would go to the Zoom group chat and where it says two, and there's a little box that usually says everyone, well, in that you can go to Ask Joe Kingsbury. So he would be the third one after that everyone um, and ask that question that you may want to ask if you just don't want to forget it during the presentation that you know type it up and we can get to it or you can save your question and ask it um, online when we're done with the presentation. If you choose to do it that way we just ask that you keep yourself muted um, until you're ready to speak. You can raise your hand uh, so that we know that you would like to ask a question and then you um, introduce yourself and ask that question. So that's how we run this type of echo. Um, that should make it go as smooth as possible. Um, our didactic presentation will be available on Box um, as indicated in, in the registration and also any case studies that's brought before. Uh, this echo will be in box as well. You know, the value of the echo is in the case study. So if you ever decide that you want to uh, write up a case and ask a question, whether it be about evaluation or about um, technology or about clinical workflow or that type of thing, you can make that into a case study. And uh, we can all learn from that and from each other as we move through this ECHO series. So thank you very much uh, for considering to do that. So today, we need to get to the didactic because you're in for a real treat. Um, what we have today is we're going to talk about some technology and we have national experts on uh, line to talk to us about that. Doris Barta, is one of our speakers and she's the director of the National Telehealth Technology Assessment Center. Uh, she has over 20 years of experience working in the telehealth field, uh, serving in the capacity of a, a telehealth network director as well as in the role of fund development. She's a great grant writer and a grant reviewer um, and she is um, the PI for um, well, she was the PI for the Northwest Telehealth Resource Center for 10 years prior to taking on this role at the national um, level. So we really appreciate Doris being here today and she is definitely very knowledgeable. So we want you to take advantage of that. Jordan Berg is the next presenter and he is a technology telehealth specialist um, with TTAC. Uh, so we um, are very fortunate to have him. He has several years of experience working in telemedicine. He's very passionate about working with people, helping them to understand and how to evaluate and assimilate telemedicine technology. So Doris and Jordan, uh, you are on. I'm going to give it to you. All right. Thank you, Janine. We really appreciate the opportunity to be able to meet with you guys today and and present for you on our thoughts about um, telemedicine technology during the COVID-19 crisis. 
So let me just share a little bit about who we are, who TTAC is. We are federally, federally funded through the Office for Advancement of Telehealth. We provide technology assessments primarily for the 12 regional telehealth resource centers, as well as the other national TRC. But we answer questions that anybody asks us, but generally our partners in the TRC world come to us if they have any questions regarding technology and technology assessment. So there's uh, Garrett Spargo. He is looking into Jordan's eye. Garrett is our PI on our grant. And between the three of us, we have over 50 years experience in telehealth. So we mentioned the telehealth resource centers. Um, Jordan, if, thanks. Uh, the, this is a map of the 12 regional telehealth resource centers. So as you can see, we serve the whole United States. You guys are in the HTRC region with Janine and Rachel and, and Evelyn. And, um, and then we serve the whole nation through TTAC. And then the other national telehealth resource center is CCHP. And um, we are all members of the National Consortium of Telehealth Resource Centers, and we do things together on a national arena, as well as the regional work that Janine and her team do with you guys. So i um, just gonna give you a short overview of what we're going to go over today. We're going to talk about the state of telemedicine technology during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to talk a little bit about the telemedicine platform trends, trends that we're seeing as people um, gear up to provide services to patients in their homes or during, um, you know, during the social distancing and, and how that's changed how we do telemedicine. We're gonna talk a little bit about the security and privacy related with that. We're going to talk about video endpoints. We're going to do a demonstration of a patient and a provider uh, providing services to the patient in their home. And then in the end, we're gonna talk a little bit about what our thoughts are regarding the telemedicine technology and how COVID-19 has changed our thought processes. Then we're gonna give you some time to do some questions and answers. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jordan to talk about the technology. Thanks, Doris. So um, the, the big force of changing telemedicine technology right now and impacting the way that we're all um, really delivering care is COVID-19. And it's really changed the telemedicine landscape um, in a way that I don't think anybody really expected. Um, uh, it's, it's really, kind of push forward telemedicine and has put it in the forefront of people's thoughts and kind of how they approach healthcare. Um, what we want to talk about is a little bit is what are the trends that, that uh, this has kind of brought about? Well, um, it's really about more people connecting more places in different ways. Um, what we're seeing for large trends is primarily a move to web-based video platforms. Um, this has been necessary in order to, to really scale up um, telemedicine technology delivery as quick, quickly and as rapidly as possible. Um, the, there's a difference in who we're connecting to. We're connecting to a lot of patients in their home, um, and that means that we're having to connect to them using their technology. So we're connecting to iPads, we're connecting to iPhones, we're connecting to um, Kindle Fires, we're connecting to all of these uh, kind of mobile devices in a, a patient's home. We're also connecting using their um, connectivity. So we're using their Wi-Fi, we're using their mobile networks, um, and that's really a change in how we've delivered telemedicine before. Um, when we're looking at uh, different telemedicine platforms in this time, uh, there's really five kind of key platform dimensions that we need to be considering, um, and we want to talk about those really quick. Uh, one is deployability. Uh, how quickly can we get these telemedicine solutions to the people that need them? Um, how quickly can we move from saying, yes, this is our need to, that's in the patient's hands and we're able to actually deliver care. The second is scalability. How rapidly can we move from seeing just a couple dozen um, patients a week to seeing hundreds of patients a week? Um, how reliable is the solution going to be over time? Is it just enough to get us through this crisis or is it something that we're gonna be robust enough to last us for years? Um, and ease of use is a really, really big one. So it's not only just the patients that we have to consider, it's the providers. We are adding 
a whole new swath of providers that have never even considered telemedicine, but now because of uh, the way healthcare's changed, they're having to pick up telemedicine technology quickly, um, and they're having to connect with patients who haven't really ever connected before either. So having uh, si uh, systems that are really easy to use, that don't require large amount of downloads, um, that can connect via just a one click, like a link or um, uh, a text message, can make it a lot more, a lot easier to deliver this care. So there's five dimensions we wanna talk about. Um, we uh, made a whole slide for the next one which is security and privacy. This has been a big concern recently. Um, it's been something that we're all kind of familiar with that we've been hearing a lot about, and we wanna talk about this a little bit. There are two kind of, um, uh, not, not, not competing, but two uh, forces that have changed the landscape for security and privacy around telemedicine during COVID-19. One is the re relaxation of some of the regulations around which platforms can be used for telemedicine. Uh, some of that is uh, around HIPAA, uh, so what we're seeing is we're seeing people connect over platforms that wouldn't necessarily be considered traditional telemedicine platforms, uh, FaceTime, Skype, uh, social media. Uh, so the OCR has put out some recent guidance as to which platforms, what types of platforms are really suitable for use in telemedicine. Um, but when, uh, but people are able to connect with a lot more uh, and a lot more varied technology than they had in the past. The second thing that we're seeing that has affected uh, the security um, standpoint in telemedicine is concerns raised over some high volume video service platforms, web-based video service platforms in re relation to security and privacy. I um, mean, this is kind of a twofold issue. One is uh, around people not understanding the training and controls um, and organizations not having really firm policies and procedures for how to do telemedicine. So uh, a lot of these systems have the adequate security controls built in, um, but people just aren't familiar with how to use them. The second is there could be concern around some of the way that uh, some of these platforms are handling their data, who has access to it, um, and kind of how they're describing what their platforms can do. So these are kind of the two big considerations when we're talking about uh, web-based video platforms. Next, we're going to move into a little bit of a demonstration. Um, this is a kind of a, a, a just a, a really practical look at what we might expect to see as we move into the patient's home as we start to interact with the patient's devices. So um, what we're going to do is Doris is going to be uh, playing a patient for us, um, and she's going to kind of simulate what the patient experience uh, kind of looks like. Um, there's a, a lot of people in the chat, so if, you, if you're able to pin Doris's uh, video so you can kind of see her a little bit larger, that might be helpful. Um, the second, and I'm gonna be the provider, so uh, I'll be able to coach Doris through a couple kind of uh, normal uh, video uh, etiquette and video uh, optimization things that we can do to get us a better experience connecting the patient at home. The first device that we're gonna be connecting to is uh, Doris on her iPad. Um, there are a lot of these devices out there. Uh, it's a pretty common platform. So I'm going to stop sharing, and then we're going to go and uh, give you this quick little demonstration. Okay, are you ready? Let's go. All right. So all right, and I got to get ready for this appointment I've got with my doctor. Rick, thank you for getting this set up for me. I've never done this before. Oh, it's good to see you, oh, Doris. Oh, hi. Hi, Dr. Berg. How are you well, doing? Hello. It's good to see you. How are you? Good to see you. Oh, gosh. I am so stressed out. Oh, you know, well, I, haven't, I haven't left my home for five weeks. I'm starting to get a little bit depressed around here. I'm, I've been babysitting my grandkids, which is driving me crazy. So let's let's talk about that a little bit more. But I'd I'd like to be able to see your face. It looks like we're not uh, kind of set up to see your face very clearly. And there's a really bright light behind you. Can you close oh. that line? Oh yeah, yeah. It's nice outside today. It's 80 degrees here. Okay. We haven't had this kind of weather for a long time. How's that? Is that working? That's much better. Um, and can we change the the angle of your camera so that I can uh, see more of your face? Oh. Do you have oh. something you can set the camera on or something you can kind of prop it against to uh, yeah. kind of, oh, there we go. Yeah, you know what, let me see. Let me, let me see if I can get, yeah. Here, I've got on my, I've got my, uh, set it on my desk. How's that? Is that working better? That's much better. Yeah, that's that's a much better view. Um, it's, it's really good to see you, Doris. How have you been feeling recently? Well, I tell you, I'm about ready to start drinking. 
<laughs> All right, so this gives us a quick demonstration of what, what some of the things that we might see on an iPad. These are mobile devices. They move around a lot. Um, they're designed to pick up audio within about three to four feet from the, the device, and they're designed really to be used with a single person. Um, Doris is going to switch over to a, a mobile device, um, and while she does that, we'll, we'll demonstrate some of the equipment here on the provider side. But um, one of the kind of rules of thumb is the smaller the device, the more challenging it can be to kind of get framed, to get a good field of view, um, and to get good audio out of it. So we'll see a little bit of a, the difference between what we get out of a tablet versus out of a mobile device. But um, we also want to talk about what's here on the provider side. So right now I'm running through a webcam, a USB webcam, and a USB audio solution. And I want to show you what it looks like and what it sounds like if we kind of down switch to the built-in peripherals for my device. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to the built-in microphone on my tablet. So you should hear I, I start sounding a little bit further away. And I'm also going to build, switch to the built-in webcam. And you can see how that kind of changes the frame and changes the colorization. Webcam, um, the built-in laptop webcams have improved um, pretty dramatically over the last couple years, but it really it can be worthwhile um, to not only upgrade your uh, webcam, but we, we experience people getting a lot of uh, improved performance by upgrading their audio solutions. So for uh, just a few uh, dollars invested in an audio solution, you can really do a lot to improve the way that you engage with patients, to put yourself closer to being in the room with the patient. Doris, are you, are you back on? Were you able to reconnect? I am, can you see me? I can't. Um, what, what, what is it we're seeing here, Doris? Well, I see you and then I see a white light. Oh, I think that might be your ceiling. Oh, oh shoot, yeah, yeah, you're right. Dang it, I didn't realize. Sorry, I, I, I'm a little bit shaky. I drank too much coffee this morning, so I didn't want to hold this. Okay, do you have a counter or a surface you can kind of put that, uh, put your device on? So, yeah, so yeah, I got a pop can here. I could probably, um, there, I got it leaning up against that. How's that, does oh, that, that work? That looks much better, we're able to see you. But um, I think it'll look even better if you can rotate your uh, phone so that it's a kind of horizontal on the table there. Oh, you mean turn the phone sideways? Turn the whole thing sideways. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. All right. There we go. How's that? Is that better? That's much better. Yep. And I can hear you as well. If you were a little further away from the microphone, it might be a little bit harder to hear you, but um, you're at a good distance away from the microphone so we can see, we can hear, we can have a good visit. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And, and kind of this is a, a just a fun little demonstration, and we're just trying to show you um, kind of some of the things that you might see. One of the, one of the big points that we, we like to try to make is um, we need to do what we can to work with the solutions that are, are out there because the crisis is right now and the solutions that are in the world are the solutions that are in the world. So whatever we can do to put our patients at ease, to put our providers at ease, and to kind of really kind of reaffirm the people that we're able to work through this, we're able to make the technology work, um, and uh, we can be flexible and we can um, just kind of engage with each other in a real human way um, and make the technology as transparent as we can possibly make it. Anything that we can do along that line is, is really, really helpful. So next, we want to kind of leave you with some thoughts. Uh, the first set of thoughts here are ones that we really pretty frequently make in almost every talk that we do. Um, these are general telemedicine technology thoughts, things that you should think about before or during any sort of telemedicine assessment or looking at new telemedicine technology. Um, the first, and we, we hammer this one home as often as we can, is that any telemedicine technology um, needs to have a really well understood, well developed, um, and well supported workflow that it supports. It needs to have a use case. Otherwise, what happens is technology is purchased there's not a clear use case for it. It ends up in a drawer. It ends up covered in dust, and it just doesn't get used. Um, and there's it, the the opportunity is lost. Um, the second that we want to the uh, point that we try to stress every single time is the importance of getting hands on with whatever telemedicine technology that you're using. Um, we find over and over again that even a brief amount of time physically holding a device, manipulating it, trying it out, using it. Um, in, a, in a mock situation that represents the use case, 
Um, those sorts of experiences are so vital to really understanding if a piece of technology is going to meet your needs or if there's certain aspects of it that you're just not seeing. Um, it's going to be a lot better um, than even looking at all the, the product reviews and the manufacturer demos and things like that. So whenever you can, get a piece of technology in, do the hands-on, um, make sure that it's going to fit your use case. And finally, make sure that you get broad support from all aspects of your organization for any telemedicine technology that you're wanting to support. So when we show a, uh, a group of people a piece of technology, they're all gonna report back to us on different aspects that make it either a good piece of technology or a bad piece of technology. Your clinicians are gonna feel differently than your administrative folks. Your administrative folks are gonna feel differently than your technical and IT folks. Getting uh, all of the key um, decision makers in the same room, um, talking about technology in the same way Documenting that and sharing that out across the organization is a really, really important step to make sure telemedicine technology goes. Um, we also want to leave you with a few uh, COVID-19 specific telemedicine points. And we kind of hit the first one a little bit. Um, when we're talking about using telemedicine during the crisis, we need to have solutions that are both flexible and robust. We need to make sure that when we um, engage with patients, um, we already know that telemedicine is a great tool. It can help us reach existing patients. Um, it can help us reach new patients that have um, been impacted by COVID-19. But what this means is that we're going to be reaching out to patients in their homes. We're going to be reaching out to them on their mobile devices. Um, and there's going to be a little bit of flexibility that's required, required by our providers. It's going to be required by our administrative staff as they kind of get these things set up and working. And um, it should be explained to the patient that, you know, having a backup method for connection, doing testing, um, you know, explaining how the visit is going to go. These are all parts of the ways that we are really investing in the, in, in, not in the technology, but in the visit. Um, and we're trying to make the technology um, as transparent as we can make it. The second point that we really want to make is around um, the security and privacy. So, if we're going to expand the way we're delivering care, if we're going to expand the number of people that we're delivering care to, we're expanding our risk. Um, and there's no way to get around it. You know, risk needs to be identified. It needs to be understood. It needs to be mitigated where we can. But um, because we're seeing more patients, because we're seeing them more ways, we're, we're going to be running more risks. And um, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we understand what those risks are. So COVID-19 has served as a great stress test for a lot of telemedicine platforms. Um, what happens when we try to rapidly scale? What happens when we are reaching out to new patient populations? And it's really revealed what we do well and what we don't do well. One of the things that we really want to emphasize is that in this time of just in time getting solutions out to people, we want to make sure that we are not skimping on training. We're not skimping on process that people understand um, what they're supposed to do, what their roles are, uh, what the controls are that they're supposed to use uh, within the different systems that they're working with because um, security and privacy is not, it's, it's not a checkbox. We can't um, evaluate a piece of technology. Oh, they signed a BAA with us. They're an encrypted piece of technology. It's all fine. No, it's, it's something that we have to take on as a daily discipline. We have to make sure that every single person in our organizations knows how they fit into our security and privacy plan um, and what their role is and that that role is important. Um, I like to say it's, we're, we're almost like we're giving a, a, a bunch of power tools to our providers and our patients. Um, if they know how to use it safely, we can build a really, really great solution for healthcare. Um, if they don't, we could potentially do more damage than good. And the last point we want to leave you with is um, as we're looking, as we're getting just-in-time solutions, as we're really ramping up as quickly as we can to see patients we've not seen before, um, we want to make sure that we're taking a thought for the future. Uh, the telemed uh, the um, COVID-19 crisis um, will uh, change and will, um, the scope of it is, is going to change. But whatever solutions that we pick, um, whatever technology that we go with, we're going to be using um, not just in COVID-19, but in beyond. So is the solutions that we're selecting, is the tools that we're using, are those going to work for us in a year? Are those going to work with, for us in five years? Are they going to be the right solutions later, further down the road? Um, if we can build smart, if we can build correctly, we can have a robust telemedicine platforms that meet our needs, not just for COVID-19, but well into the future. Um, and 
we, th there's no mistake, COVID-19 is gonna really change um, how we deliver healthcare. Uh, there's been um, a lot of demand. Um, and once, uh, once the population is kind of experienced, and not, not just in telemedicine, but in working from home, um, we're gonna be more of a tele-connected um, society. Um, and telemedicine is just gonna be one aspect of that. And we need to prepare for how our patients and how our providers are gonna expect to connect and expect to interact into the future. So those are the thoughts and um, ideas that we had for you. Uh, we want to make sure that you know how to get a hold of us. Um, our website is telehealthtechnology.org. Uh, you can contact us. Uh, you can put in a technical assistance request um, and ask specific questions about particular telemedicine technologies that you're interested in. You can also find our toolkits and our um, innovation watch posts on our site. Um, they're great ways to get up to speed on technology quickly. Um, and we're here as a resource for you. We're a free resource, so feel free to contact us. Um, and we'd like to open the floor for any questions that might be out there. Thank you so much. That, that was an excellent presentation and, and such an ideal way to show um, how patients could be using their technology from home and how we have to coach those patients through that now during this, um, like you say, just in time implementation of telemedicine. So thank you for that, Jordan and Doris. Um, take note of this um, website address, the te telehealthtechnology.org. Um, if you go to that website, there is a, a box that you can ask um, Doris and Jordan, anything that you want to in terms of technology, and they would be happy to answer that for you. And there are also toolkits on that um, website that are so helpful so that you can look at some of this technology and compare and contrast things like stethoscopes or exam cams. So they've done a really good vendor neutral type of um, of uh, you know, looking at the equipment without you having to hear a sales pitch, which is sometimes really a, a nice and quick way to get through that kind of material. So make sure you use this uh, website and uh, make sure that you uh, use um, Doris and Jordan today because they're here to answer your questions. So I am going to open this up to Joe and see if we have any questions in the chat box or if anything else has come in? Uh, we do. We do have a couple of questions. Um, the first, uh, could you speak to the creative ways that organizations are providing tech support to patients and doctors amidst failing connections to help allow for a more seamless experience? Yeah, I, I think one of the um, one, there, uh, there's kind of two points here. One is whenever possible, it's always good if we're reaching out to a new patient to do a trial run, um, to do a test connection, to make sure that they are able to connect. Um, I, I think uh, if, if we can connect them to an admin person, um, someone that can reach out to them, make the connection for the first time, walk them through a few simple controls. Here's how you mute, here's how you unmute. Um, you know, maybe walk them through some, some light troubleshooting. Um, we can't spend a whole lot of time going into this, and each situation is going to be a little bit different. But um, if you can head off 75% of the problems with a quick call from an administrative person, um, that'll really save you a lot of time and a lot of frustration when you're connecting that provider on. Um, so that's one of the things that uh, we recommend. Uh, second is solutions that connect via um, simple, lightweight applications are really good for the provider uh, for provider to patient connect connections. So things that don't require a download, um, they don't require you to have to install drivers or, or anything like that. So web-based um, uh, lightweight video solutions can make it a really easy thing to connect to patients um, in their home. But whenever possible, connect um, prior to your actual video visit. And then um, make sure that you have a kind of a fallback plan. You have a, 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 a other, another type of connection you can do. A phone um, is, is a good, good way. You want to make sure that you have a way to stay in touch with the patient um, if the video isn't working. And then one of the things that I like to encourage people is if you're in a video call, um, you know, we, uh, I've always recommended a, a five minute rule. Um, so if you're trying to interact with a patient and it's not connecting, 
Um, don't spend a lot of time trying to troubleshoot or make it go or connect and connect and connect. Um, sometimes it's better to go to that backup connection plan um, sooner rather than later. And then reassure and reaffirm your patients that this is kind of part of the process. Um, you, you have multiple ways to connect with them because it's important that you connect and that um, you know, the technology is secondary to the fact that you need to interact with them. Thank you, Jordan. That was, that was an excellent answer. Any other um, thoughts about that in terms of uh, use of lightweight video technology? All right, seeing, seeing that y'all are shy today. I don't know what's going on. I guess it's Thursday and it's not Friday, so we can't quit yet, but. <laughs> I have a quick question actually. Um, sure. Hi, I'm Shana Costello. I work at the uh, Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. So I'm actually on a research um, study right now that is implementing in primary care. And one thing that we've noticed as we've started to do telehealth visits is that some of our families don't want to turn their video on. So it's not necessarily a connection issue, but they, you know, they can connect fine, but then they just don't want to turn the video on. So just curious if there's anything that you've kind of seen to prompt that being more readily used, I guess. That is an excellent question, and I'm going to throw that out to uh, some of you providers who have been doing telemedicine for quite some time to answer that. So this is Kristen. I'll take um, a stab at that. So again, I'm a pediatrician, and I've been using telemedicine through Show Me um, through Missouri Telehealth Network for about 12 years, uh, and then obviously in the last uh, four weeks, I've been doing direct to home. Um, and I think it's about relationships. And so I think it's really about trying to help them um, feel comfortable, you know, that this is really no different than you being in the exam room with me. And I know it's kind of awkward that I can see your kitchen or your living room or your couch, or your kids, or your cats, or your dogs or whatever. Um, but you can see mine too. And so trying to help them know that um, it's just a it's just the new kind of the new way. And so for example, um, yesterday I had a visit with a family and we were by phone only. And um, I'll be honest, like I really needed to see that kid because of, there was some very vulnerable situations that I was concerned about. Um, the family kept saying, we can't do Zoom, we can't do Zoom, we can't do Zoom. Um, Cause I had my staff calling to try to get them to do it. Anyway, so I went ahead and did the phone only. And then I just said, you know, hey, just curious, you know, have you tried to download the Zoom app? And they said, um, well, we actually did download it, but we can't figure out how to use it. And I said, well, let's try it. And so um, I just kept them on the phone um, and then they got on and I said, wait, I think I'm about to see you. Um, and so then they did it and the little, so I'm an autism doctor. So the little girl has autism and her little face showed up. And of course she got excited and I got excited and everybody was excited, um, but, that's also a way to do it too. So you can kind of just keep breaking down those barriers. So if you're doing a phone only or an audio only, you could just say, well, why don't we just test it? Um, and that I've done a couple of times and it's actually worked pretty well. So you can just at least, and so what I said with this family was, perfect. Now, next time we see each other, we can do it this way. And they were like, okay, which I was like, score, because I need to see you in person or, you know, I need to, I need to lay eyes on her. Um, so I can make sure she's safe. So anyway, I think those are, it's about that relationship, but just taking those baby steps, um, I think makes a big difference. So thinking about those strategies can help. You know, um, let me, I, I'd like to just uh, chime in here. We started a integrating behavior health into primary care program about a year and a half ago, and we use Zoom. And all the people out in the field, we, we sent out the Jabras and the cameras like Jordan talked about. They didn't want to use them. They didn't, you know, they wanted to keep the cameras off. And we had regularly scheduled weekly meetings with the staff where they were required to come on the Zoom call. And so because the staff became comfortable with it, it made it more comfortable for the patient. So when the patient came in, the staff was familiar with the technology. They were, hey, this is really great, you know, and, and so that really helped too. So I think 
just continual use of the technology. All of you guys are very familiar with using Zoom, I can tell. you. Everybody's muted when they're not talking, you know, they unmute when they do talk. Um, you know, you're all really nicely positioned in your, in your, you know, in your frame. So it's just a matter of continual use and then people get more comfortable with it too. I think asking the multiple times is a-okay too. Um, just from um, multiple folks that they trust kind of, I think that helps families sometimes. Sometimes we have the families turn off the picture in picture starting out. Sometimes that helps with folks' comfort. And then I, I really like your suggestion, Kristen, you know, you know, great to see, see your smile today or as soon as you can, kind of reinforcing something you're seeing in their environment. Excellent points. Thank you so much. Appreciate all that input and uh, let us know how that goes uh, for you and, and um, see if you can um, increase those Zoom pictures. Yes, as you thanks go everyone. Those are great suggestions. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Very good. All right. Any other questions, Joe? Actually, yes. Uh, so we, uh, next up, uh, are there any recommendations of processes to gather patient feedback about experience or improvement opportunities, et cetera? We launched telemedicine due to COVID and it looks like Press Ganey currently only has about 13 academic centers assessing telemedicine experience via their survey. Any others? I'll just say press gaining can sometimes be a little challenging because of questions related to being in the waiting room and some things that make it apples to oranges. So um, th that one sometimes can be a little challenging. Hi, this is Junie. I'm the one who asked that question about press gaining. So they actually have a module that they've implemented now that's specific to telehealth visits. Um, the only issue is it's a very small comparison peer group. And so I think it in some ways skews the data a little too strongly one way or the other. So thankfully at Baylor, we've seen it skew really positively. But um, I'm just interested as far as being within an organization that's early on and implementing telemedicine and sort of having jumped into it primarily for uh, because of COVID. Um, what are other ways to get that feedback? You know, whether it's focus group from patients, focus groups with patients who have had the pleasure of going through this and having it happen successfully, or you know, waiting until you're further down the line and looking back to kind of ask those questions about opportunities for improvement and that sort of thing. Would anybody like to weigh in? I think pairing the qualitative and quantitative, that's great on so many fronts as we continuously improve our own uh, programs. And then, you know, as we're talking to hospital leadership or to funders or um, to insurers, all, all that set of folks, I, I agree with you. I think that can be really persuasive. Um, I might add in, I believe that Sprout, the AAP's telehealth group, is developing a set of metrics that might complement and, and have a little more uh, fine-grained detail um, to, to the press gaining measure you're describing. Yeah, and, and depending on the platform, uh, I know a lot of the you know, telemedicine dedicated platforms, you can embed your own survey um, uh, so you can you know connect to a survey monkey or a press gainy or, or however to collect kind of um, more customized survey data regarding your platform partic particularly and a lot of different platforms have that functionality so that when the visit ends the survey pops up kind of right immediately. Very good. Thank you for that. All right, Joe. All right, next up, for a program like Zoom, is there a way to show patients information or videos while they're waiting for the provider to start the meeting? This is Rachel, everybody. I can take that a little bit. I just heard a very interesting use case and, and um, 
Jordan and Doris and Janine probably also read a little bit about this one. There's a group over at University of Kentucky that's utilizing Zoom in a very interesting way to run a clinic. So they put people in um, a breakout room um, as they join and keep them there as a waiting room until the provider is ready for their next patient. So actually, so it's, so it's a, what I would call a resource heavy way to utilize Zoom because you have to have um, at least one co-host helping you uh, utilize it in that way. Um, they probably have either a passcode or a separate uh, way to get in, or they have, or they set the setting where someone has to, they automatically go to a waiting room and then someone has to allow them to come into that breakout room first, and then they're transitioned into the main meeting room next. Um, but when they're in that other room, they could, you could share documents with them or videos with them. Jordan, does that seem seem about right? Yeah, absolutely. You could have a presenter in the breakout room. Um, yeah, so and that, that would work better for um, kind of kind of group or if you had a process where you were kind of running through a, a series of patients and you wanted to pass them from point to point to point. Um, and then other applications do have uh, kind of built-in waiting room functionality where when the patient joins, they're either given intake, mm -hmm. intake documentation so they can fill out PDFs and things like that. Um, or you know you can you can show them media and stuff while they're waiting to join with the provider. Um, it, it depends a lot platform to platform. If that's something that's really key, it's it, it's a feature set you should look for. That is so awesome, and here's why: because so many people just keep getting stuck in like waiting land, and so then they don't know if I'm coming or not because I'm usually late. Um, and so that's really cool. That would be an interesting. Um, hmm. It'd be interesting to better understand. I'm sure as we get better at this, we'll get more sophisticated at it, but that's really, huh, it's really interesting. Another conversation we've been having with folks a lot um, just recently has been um, using your clinical process, um, using your the, the way you run your clinic to run your video visits. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe you have a, a, a nurse or maybe you have an assistant that goes in when the patient's physically there, they go in, they collect information, they do the, the paperwork, they kind of gather that for you. Um, you could simulate something like that pretty easily with most platforms where you have a room, the patient joins the room, you have someone join into the room, collect the information. You could even have the provider come in, um, share all that together, do a warm handoff, and then have that nurse or whoever that assistant is hop out. So there, there's ways that we can kind of um, build um, similar processes to what we're doing in person in a clinical environment in a virtual space and make that work pretty smoothly. Great point, Jordan. I, I do appreciate when we can say that, uh, you know, the standard of care needs to be the same, whether it's in person or if it's by televideo. And by doing that, it is almost like you know, being there, okay? Um, and pretty soon, I think that you say this a lot, Jordan, and I love this quote, is that pretty soon the technology disappears and it's just a visit. And maybe someday we won't even call it telemedicine, we'll just call it medicine because that's exactly what it is. All right, Joe, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. How are others incorporating intake materials into televisits like PHQ, GAD, Columbia, et cetera? Anyone to take a stab at this? Well, of, uh, for our clinic, Janine, it's kind of like you were describing before. Um, we have those as uh, we have um, G the GAD7, the PHQ9. Um, we're just starting the Columbia, but it, you know, that's what we're doing on site. So we've incorporated it into the telehealth visits. That's, that's what we're doing too. And then our um, LCSW, who usually does the tele visits, he will go over the, the PHQ9 with a monthly to update it. And he just has it sitting there and he just asks them the questions rather than having them fill it out because we need to update it monthly. So it's just a way for, um, for him to gather some of that information from the patient.
Very good. Thank you for that input. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? All right, Joe, we're back to you. That exhausts my list. Is that right? All right. So what about any questions that you may have that you would like to ask uh, verbally instead of written? Anyone have a question that they are just, they have this burning desire to ask? This is Jimmy again, we do have one. Um, so, so it was interesting to see kind of that role play that you guys did, and that was actually very useful. Sorry, ex excuse my toddler who's trying to join the meeting back here. But um, one of the things I wonder about is not a lot of people are very comfortable with hopping. You know, you presented last time. You're obviously a natural behind the camera. You enjoy it. You know how to sort of joke through all the different uh, different scenarios. But for a lot of clinicians, that's not a natural way to be. And so I know we've talked a lot about the different things you do sort of from an etiquette perspective to, to make the visit go well as far as positioning the camera and just set up of the room. But how do you train people who are used to dealing with people face to face to then deal with them sort of screen to screen? What an excellent question. I do know that there are some practices that have taken um, some of this, what we call telehealth etiquette and put it into some documents, not just for providers because providers need that reminder too, um, but also for their patients, like what to expect from a telehealth visit. And sometimes those kinds of uh, written documents that can be sent through a patient portal or just by email, that type of thing would would be of assistance so that maybe it's not so awkward, but then there is still some coaching that's probably going to have to happen um, on that first telemedicine visit. Anyone want to weigh in on this? Um, yeah, I'll weigh in a little bit, Janine. So part of what Jordan talked about a little bit earlier is really having someone on your team that can um, schedule a, a trial with that patient beforehand. It, that could be a, um, an, an admin assistant. It doesn't necessarily need to be a clinician, just somebody who can actually connect with that patient and talk with them a little bit about centering and placing their equipment and that kind of stuff. If you don't have that, you know, the, the luxury of having a staff person that can help you with that. I think, um, you know, reach out to, to people like Janine and, and Rachel. Uh, the TRCs have put together some really good workflows and protocols for, for um, telemedicine visits that normally people don't think of. We have some really good video ones that are done with stick figures that are animated from a patient perspective and also from a provider perspective that um, they could steer you towards. Um, you're absolutely right, Jordan's very comfortable with the technology, but um, you know our goal really is, is to make it as easy on both the provider and the patient as possible. So if we can do any troubleshooting beforehand for both of them, um, we want to make this a good experience for everyone, right? And, and so for the provider as well as for the patient, we want to make this a, a good experience. So a little bit of uh, prevention on the front end um, is much better than a pound of care on the back end. Yeah, I'd like to add it too. Anything that you can do to um, expose your providers to this kind of technology in as low risk of environment as you can before having them interact with patients. So there's a couple things that kind of leap to mind. One is mock visits. I, I know it can be annoying for providers to do the mock visits and it seems kind of silly, but um, you know, even the silliness of it, if, if they can kind of be like, oh yeah, yeah, okay. You know, even that can help them kind of just remove some of the anxiety and the like, what do I do? Um, you know, and, and make it more natural. Um, meetings, uh, you can even have just uh, kind of some of your normal meetings. And some of this is going to be just a natural progression as we mo we telecommute more and more and more. Uh, making sure that your providers engage with meetings, making sure people are familiar with how to turn the cameras on and off. 
what you want to do is you want to remove all the pointy edges from your your platform and then the other thing is um making sure that uh you have when you're if you're picking a technology make sure you have providers involved kind of at the beginning and maybe not the providers not the ones that are really gung-ho for technology uh, maybe loop in some providers that are a little bit more resistance because they're going to be able to tell you whether or not it's a simple thing to use or if it's not a simple thing to use um, and they're going to be able to tell you like this doesn't really work for me or this does work for me so um, basically, we, if we can make it as, as low risk as we can and, and have a lot of interactions before um, we're necessarily engaging with patients, which isn't always easy now, um, but a, a little, uh, just kind of reducing the unknown factor from the technology is probably the easiest thing to do. Thank you, Jordan. I agree with that. Um, they, they may scoff at it if you say we need to do this mock, you know, trial or whatever, but uh, they, they end up really appreciating that. Mm -hmm. um, looking in the chat box, um, Michelle, you have a question. Would you like to ask that question out loud? Or I'll go ahead and read it. Does your organization offer webinars and trainings? And um, yes, uh, all, H, uh, all TRCs offer uh, trainings and webinars. We're uh, guest speaking a lot these days. I know Doris and Jordan have been kept on their toes throughout this, but we, um, the HTRC actually has a webinar series that happens the first Tuesday of every month at noon. Um, and it, you can find that information by going to heartlandtrc.org. And there you can also look at some of the other types of things that are available from the Telehealth Resource Center. And we'd be happy to discuss any of that with you um, if you need some help with training. And, um, and the webinars, you know, uh, definitely join those because we're going to be talking. I think Robert uh, is going to talk about um, some of the updated regulations for state and federal at our next one. Uh, Actually, uh, the next meeting we will do an overview of the CARE Act. We will kind of talk about the various items that are in it in terms of funding because it's a pretty extensive amount of funding, not just specifically related to COVID-19. It's got reauthorization of a number of programs, uh, funding for actually up to fiscal year 2025 for some federal health care workforce programs and some other things. Um, but we'll also talk about especially some of the things that have come out and already implemented, uh, specifically the FQHC and RHC rules and some other things that have come out of the, the uh, CARES Act as well as the interim final rule and just sort of an update on um, sort of opportunities. Uh, there's going to be a lot of funding opportunities, not only related to COVID-19, um, but like most times when the federal government does a big stimulus bill, it has a lot of things in it. And those of you who may have officer or health policy funding or be interested in that, um, there's gonna be an expansion or, or more funding from any of those programs as well as other workforce programs like the National Health Service Corps. So we'll be talking about that next week with a brief overview, but also specifically looking at telehealth components uh, that are in the CARES Act. Great, thank you, Robert. That will be information packed. So make sure that you join us and bring your lunch because it's at noon, it's fine. Just eat along and, and listen to everything that Robert will have to say. Any other questions? Um, did Sharon have her hand up at one point that she wants to ask a, a question? Comment, if I can jump in real quick. This is Kristen. Um, so a quick comment, just in thinking about how to help providers use and get more comfortable using tele um, virtual visits. So kind of twofold. So I think that, you know, a lot of us, um, it is good to practice. We're pretty busy right now. So um, sometimes practicing might not work out so great, um, but that's okay. Um, I think again, reminding them those simple, simple things like we talked about last time. Um, try to treat it as much like your normal visit as you can, I think is really helpful. Um, I wanted to make a comment though about trying to engage residents and medical students as often as we can. So if you're at an academic medical center, which I know some are, some aren't that are joining us today, but having them watch you do it. So I have been integrating all of my students of whatever variety I, that I can so that they get to see it in action because the more they can see it, the more comfortable that they get. So 
please, if you are a provider, try to drag them along so that they can watch you do it. Um, I also am kind of a believer of just throwing people into the fire. So they actually do it and then they text me and tell me when they're ready. So they, they start the visit and then I join them. Um, so ha, lucky you if, you're, if I'm your attending, um, but I do prep them before they do it. But so those are things that I think are really important as we teach our up and coming um, residents and students that this is really important. But then the flip of that. So if you're joining us today for this echo and you're coming at this from a clinic support or administration or whatever, if you can do whatever you can to prep that patient for the visit, that helps a ton. So I can tell you that many, many of the patients are showing up um, kind of like Jordan. Um, they don't know what's happening. And so a lot of the, for, so I'm peds, right? M most of my families are not showing up with their child. Um, the child is asleep or outside or at the neighbors or wherever they are. Um, and they are like shocked that they should have the kid there, which is shocking to me um, because they show up to the doctor's appointment with them. So anyway, whatever you can do from the staff side to help the parent know, okay, here are the ABCs, one, two, three, um, bring the child. Uh, that is awesome. Have your clothes on, like I was teasing about last time. Um, but those are things that can be really useful. So again, the providers can practice, but the staff can also do a great job of preparing um, the patient. That'll be a win-win um, on both sides of the of the you know the clinical um, team. So just thought I'd throw those couple of things out there. Great, thank you, Kristen. We appreciate that. Sharon, um, you have a hand up. Um, um, you are, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, I have a question. I know this won't come up uh, that frequently, but you're doing your telepsych visit with your patient. You may or may not be able to see them, but you um, are sensing that they're having a decompensation. What um, would be an appropriate action to take, they are going to need, they may or may not need um, to step up to a higher level of care. Um, but where would you go, uh, what would be the next step in making that determination? They may not be saying, oh, I want to kill myself, but you're sensing they're becoming more psychotic or more depressed. You can do um, a medication adjustment, but you're probably going to want to see them again, telepsych the next few days. But if they're sensing they need some help, like an emergency room visit or an in person face to face kind of visit, what would be an appropriate step? Um, because you can't always tell um, over telepsych, and I've done telepsych for a while, um, what the, you know, what is actually going on based what they're presenting on the video or telephone. So any thoughts on that? What are people doing with that? Thank you, Sharon, for that question. And knowing that we are at the top of the hour, I know if you need to go, that's fine. Yes. Uh, but we do want to ask, uh, answer this one last question. So Evelyn, do you have some thoughts? I think that's so nicely put, Sharon. Um, it's certainly something all of uh, our behavioral providers, you know, we're, we're trying to plan ahead and, and best lay plans. I, I really like the, what you're saying about having that emergency plan um, good to go before we're seeing the patient. Um, again, this is probably things you've already thought about, but, you know, making sure ahead of uh, behavioral appointments that we have that patient's location and phone um, and have an idea of what their local emergency services are. Um, I know I work more with kids, so we, we often put that on paper with the parent and family, um, but I know that would have to meet your own particular patient population. Um, for the handful of patients that um, uh, my colleagues and myself have had who have gone from um, being in telemed to uh, inpatient, I think the same strategies that we tend to use in person, really leveraging our relationship with that patient, um, and then you know talking them through, this is what it's going to look like when you um, come to the ED or whatever your plan is, um, and kind of just being pretty practical about talking about that. Um, 
during COVID, one thing my colleagues are also doing um, with, of course, the permission of the, the patient is having um, the caregiver or, or loved one or person who can support that patient in the home and is often already supporting them, um, having release of information to talk with them. Um, and it was some cases even having a plan to talk with them with the patient after appointments. Thank you, Evelyn. We appreciate that answer. Um, knowing that if we are past the top of the hour, I just want to make sure that um, we thank Jordan and Doris. Doris had to leave already, so but Jordan, we thank you and Doris for the excellent presentation, um, as well as I want to shout out to all you parents out there who are trying to work and take care of kids and school those kids. You guys are heroes as well. So. Uh, don't ever be ashamed or embarrassed about your kids showing up in your frame because uh, we know what's going on, we understand, and we love that you have uh, given us an hour of your time to learn more about telemedicine. So thank you for that. All right, we'll see you next week. Um, be prepared because we're going to have more information about telemedicine as we go along and would love to have you join us again. Thank you guys. Bye.